Hey, uh, please join me in welcoming back Ricky D. Ambrose. So yeah, I've got a few questions, but we also, of course, <laughs> want to open it up to the audience. Um, I almost want to start, maybe this is a bad question, uh, but watching it just at the end I, and hearing uh, Keith or Todd uh, say, talking about him appearing made me wonder about the title, No, It's Not an Appearance, mm. and the word appear or disappear. Uh, well, David, um, <clears throat> the disappearance of David, I always thought it was becoming an occasion for uh, all these other things to rear their head or to appear in place. I mean, Sorry. this kind of now you see it, now you don't quality of, of the movie in which a gap is filled with something. Um, the, 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 someone's disappearance is filled up with all of these stories that are not true about where he is and whether he'll be coming back. Uh, the, you know, this is, this is very marginal in terms of what the movie's about, but in the very beginning of the film, in David's family home, there's something that's very unclear because it was cut significantly uh, during the edit, but there's a woman crying in the kitchen uh, with the floral wallpaper, and uh, the man whispers something into her ear, and originally the, the scene was a woman upset because she's celebrating her birthday and her parents aren't there, and the man whispers something like, uh, what's happening now is exactly what your parents would have wanted for you, which in a way is mirrored by, um, by what Todd says toward the end of the film, this kind of fable about how you'll see David again, and which he knows is not true. Um, but yeah, I mean, this idea of like, telling stories to people, uh, using, using an absence as an occasion to uh, uh, to make other types of things or stories uh, or feelings appear. Yeah. yeah, I almost took it in another way too, with appearance as like a public appearance, uh, with the uh, the translation panel, and then also being an archive of this um, or going through the archives. Is, is, is there any thing in that? Or I'm just uh, also curious about that aspect of the film and its relation to, to David, someone disappearing and then a public figure with... Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a public figure, Taubus, who's this fictitious uh, kind of demonic, sick, fascist kook who uh, has a, who, who's, whose legacy doesn't want to be treated as such by uh, presumably by someone like Todd who is writing a biography about him. Uh, there's this public facing role that is very important to those characters in this film uh, that is I think very much at odds with uh, a character like David who does disappear, who doesn't have any public facing role. He doesn't really have a public face or a face at all. He's kind of a largely anonymous guy. Uh, but yeah, in, in that sense, you're, you're right, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I was going to say, it's only just when you were talking about, um, you said you cut something from the film. There's the use of, uh, I love the use of ellipses in this film. It's like there's so many great moments. So yeah, in that translation panel where it sort of cuts to the end of the panel and we don't hear them talk. Or at the art gallery where we see the descriptions of the pieces but not it. And I was wondering, um, I, I suppose maybe there were, so, did some ellipses happen in the edit and some were written? Or how do you write for ellipses? <laughs> The, I mean, the, the, the translation panel, I, I, well, I will say the film, this film I wrote about 10 years ago, uh, and it was a very different script. It was a very talky script. It was this rambling thing that I thought was going to be much, much longer and have uh, not have a, this involvement of a disappearance. But uh, f each draft retained this translation panel, and it was always this concise beginning and beginning and intro or intro and conclusion with uh, snippets of the audience's questions or they're not really questions I guess they're just statements one in French um, the same with the art gallery tags but yeah during the, what I thought was going to be a 75 minute 80 minute movie became 60 minutes or actually 55 minutes uh, during the edit there were there was a second there was a second roommate who was cut out of the film. There, there were some scenes early on in Chappaqua or some shots early on in Chappaqua that were cut out, um, not only to preserve some or to emphasize some idea of ellipsis, but also because during the edit, it became more apparent that David and Todd's relationship was the thing that interested me more. And by cutting out uh, these other people who seemed more extraneous to, to that relationship, uh, that became more crucial. Great. Yeah. Um, economy is a word that's often used when describing this film, uh, partially because, I mean, it's such a, a rigorous and sort of refined style. But then also, um, 
perhaps practically in terms of production style. And I'm almost wondering about the way in which you chose to um, depict Milan, for instance via a postcard and uh, the way you, you shoot many of your interiors. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that relationship. Um, well, uh, <laughs> well, the movie was shot for $20,000, $20, 11 days. Uh, and that imposed, imposes certain <laughs> restrictions <laughs> on what you can do. I, I mean, I, uh, yeah, the idea of not going, the, the idea of showing Milan as an apart, apartment interior or as a postcard or as a clip, a, a video clip from the back of a streetcar contributes to something maybe thematically or stylistically to the film, but also it is a way to economize in the sense that you have a very limited amount of money and a very limited number of, of people working for you and that you want to be able to you want to be able to shoot something that is meant to take place in a cafe but you can't get permission to shoot in a cafe in New York City because they want a certain amount of money so you get a tabletop in an apartment and you put a camera over it, and you record all the sounds separately. The party kids, so to speak, who you hear are recorded at a separate time. Uh, Talbis gives a speech. Initially, I thought we would go to a bookstore, and that we would fill the room, the bookstore, with extras who were coming to watch Stephen Talbis give this speech. Uh, and then and said, well, no, it's going to have to be a recording. We can't get a lecture hall or a bookstore. Uh, and let's have, uh, let's have Todd or his roommate making coffee. Well, this thing that's playing, which is very different from this domestic routine of making coffee, uh, is paired with it. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. When you describe the home scene, there's a scene you said uh, where there's wall. Do you say when there's wallpaper in the background? And that yeah, made yeah. me think that's yeah. the only time we see. Is that the only time we see wallpaper? Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess like a Milan apartment, a New York apartment. So often there's sort of these white or almost abstracted backgrounds. But then at times, um, some very, uh, like, I almost feel, are you trying to draw our attention to it? Like, f when uh, the shot of Stephen Gerwitz is suddenly red, and then James, it's yellow, it almost feels like portraiture or sort of, um, and then those those green screens that appear. Um, yeah, it's, is it, are you? Well, yeah, well, to, to talk about the, the green first, um, uh, I, wanted, I wanted the film to be clearly cut up into segments, uh, have a very tidy organization. And uh, at first, I thought there would be part one, part two, part three, or there'd be intertitles that indicate these parts. And then it seemed simply just more interesting uh, to have colored sections s dividing up these uh, parts of the film. But I, I always knew that the movie would open with some color, like a, 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 whether it be blue or green, that one of the first things you would see would be uh, a color with a piece of music and to and kind of enter into the film and I just decided to retain that as a structuring de device but the you're right about the faces in front of red and in front of yellow and in front of white I mean it, it, it separates it gives some kind of idea of space perhaps um, but again you're shooting in a living room in Ditmas Park in Brooklyn and you put up some yellow uh, craft paper because that's meant to be the apartment of the cousin, or that's meant to be the coffee shop in which Madeline goes in and sees this guy looking at her. It's uh, it's another way to to cheat. But when you put up the yellow, were you thinking of James, or did, like I'm also kind of curious. Like it's I, I love the sort of the, there's so many sort of somewhat recognizable personas or actors or personalities. Uh, so I was a little curious to hear about how you work with actors, but also almost more specifically. So many of the actors just seem so um, cinema literate. Or is, is that an advantage or a disadvantage um, in achieving performance? I think it's an advantage in the sense that a lot of the people in this film who I cast are as friends of mine, mainly for convenience. And they're people I like. And they're people who are available. And they're not unionized. And you could use them. And they show up. And you don't need to pay them. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but a lot of the people, like J James Wilkins is a filmmaker. Uh, Keith Paulson, who plays Todd, is not a filmmaker, but he watches a great many movies. We have kind of shared reference points. Uh, I, I was able to, I, I wouldn't really have to do much with their performances. I, I think the script was also written in a very declarative way, and it was, I think, apparent to all the people who read the script how, how, what the performance style would be. And I had shown the short films I had made before this to the actors, and they, 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 they understood. I didn't need to 
uh, I, I didn't need to do much work. And having uh, working with people who watch the same types of movies I do or who like the same types of movies I do, uh, it was uh, like a, a kind of learning curve that didn't really n need to exist, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience? Hard to see is bright light. No one? <laughs> I'm curious about um, the videotapes um, and the VHS tapes, where they came from, and also um, the aspect ratio, too. Yeah. Um, when you said it could have been green or blue, if it was blue, it would feel like the VHS ta tape stopping. Uh -huh. But uh, um, uh, the uh, VHS tapes were. Um, most of them, the World Trade Center Tower, and then two, what, kind of a riverside with bells and um, uh, kind of a wooded path, if I'm remembering right. Th those were those were tapes that I that were kind of given to me that were taken on on when I was younger by my father uh, on trips in in the United States, and I've had them for many years, and I've had them digitized for many years, and it just occurred to me that. Um, you know, especially the World Trade Center uh, towers, that I wanted to use them in some way. And one of the clips was used in a short film I made called Spiral Jetty, which is kind of a draft of this film. The others were found um, on like, like, uh, Turkey, I think, in Berlin, and one is Hawaii, the waves. Uh, was were, Those were things that were found uh, online. Uh, they just seemed like, well, Except Hawaii, maybe they seem like places that Tabas would somehow be on some kind of fact-finding mission with a video camera, and he would just be filming things for whatever purposes, uh, you know. Yeah. You the, oh, the aspect ratio. Yeah, the aspect uh, ratio. Yeah, the aspect ratio. Um, uh, because I didn't like the idea of going from four by three or from a square for the VHS to sixteen by nine for the HD video. Uh, jumping between those two aspect ratios, it was a way to just it was one decision to keep to keep it consistent without having to zoom without having to enlarge the VHS footage to get to a 16 by 9 frame. But also, uh, I noticed that when I and I, I designed all of the and printed all of the newspaper articles in ephemera, you see, that it it just seems more it seems better adapted that shape to newspaper columns than a rectangle. Yeah, yeah. I've seen your film twice, but on Vimeo. But seeing it in the theater, the square ratio just makes it seem so graphic in the way that the... Uh, yeah, can you talk a little... I was curious uh, when you said that you showed the script to the actors and they got it. And then also thinking of these materials, I'm just curious about how you how you shape the film or how you write um, this, how, how you plan it out. It was written as a grid, um, or at least the the... The, 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 the later drafts were written in kind of a pretty deliberate, strategic way. Uh, the columns and rows, and each each column was a, a part uh, that you see separated by the green screen in the film. And uh, it became a matter of trying, without being too schematic about it, but finding correspondences from from row to row, and column, column to column and row to row, so that certain images that appear, uh, say, in part one, will reappear at a certain point later on in the film. Close-ups are matched, or the coffee shop sequences r are reiterated in a kind of very deliberate way. Uh, I always knew there would be a movie about a disappearance, and that there would be consequences to the disappearance, and people would respond to it in certain ways. But that shape, that grid that I ended up um, trying to fit the film into had a pretty significant um, impact on how the script itself was written. It gave it a certain design that I wanted to stick to. Questions? Yeah. How did you come up with the translator character? Was she based off someone you knew or a group of people? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, not someone I know personally. There was a, I mean, I guess I could, no one really knows who this, who this, who this person is. There was this PhD student uh, at Columbia who used to write for this journal, N plus one, which is a New York literary journal. And I had seen a recording of her talking about something at the New York Public Library. And she had this black dress on and this very, this kind of like, um, oh, it was a, <laughs> the way she spoke was kind of stuck out to me. And this was her, her voice. And this was the model, I mean, a pr kind of performance model for Madeline James, who plays Karen. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, re I remember moving to New York when David is meant to be in his early 20s. And uh, 
you know, you, someone says at your age you should be placing pieces in as many outlets as possible, which is, I think, such a terrible thing to say to a young person and in many ways what a deflating thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if you hang around certain people who read certain magazines, uh, who write for certain places in New York City, you, uh, there's a certain archetype that forms that doesn't have to go far to look for it. Uh, anyone else? Uh, the use of sound is, uh, I was curious about that too in the planning of the film. Um, it seems like ambient sounds play an importance, but the film is also uh, punctuated with uh, sort of classical music at times. Um, uh, yeah, is that, is that planned out far ahead or? The sound is very, the, the sound design, all the, the, the incidental sound, the, the, the cars, the sound of, um, yeah, the sound of the, the beach, the seagulls, all of these things were, were marked in the script. And they're also marked in this chart that I was talking about, about how I divided up the film. The, the music, I, you know, I, uh, I kind of like the idea of giving David a, that character his theme, uh, which is this piece of music that opens and closes the film. Uh, and, and kind of gives the movie a nice, I think, lift from this tone that is set throughout most of the film. And seeing David out with a flourish with, uh, uh, with an opera seemed like a, uh, a kind of something that I hadn't expected to do, but it, just playing the music with that shot seemed uh, interesting to me, and I decided just to keep it. Okay. We only have time for one more question. Should I ask the last question? Um, there, oh yeah, we got someone. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I was gonna ask about um, a lot of the like objects in the film. Like clearly, you have uh, like an affinity for design and whatnot. I'm wondering where a lot of them come from. Like some of those mugs really were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the mugs. Well, thanks to uh, <laughs> thanks to the restaurant supply stores of Chinatown in, in Lower Manhattan, one could go and find these great diner diner cups and uh, the, the nice short water glasses. And uh, I mean, it, I spending a lot of time having writ, you know, writing the script in places like that, you become very alert to, to those things. And you tend to pe keep your head down looking at a tabletop and you're being served coffee and you're listening to people. And that has some kind of, it kind of gives you a rhythm with which to to set the film in, and those objects become very important. All of the, the paper, I mean, with very few exceptions, there are some props in the film, like a copy of Book Forum with Robert Maplethorpe's face on it. Those I didn't design, but the newspaper articles I did, and the Taubus book covers, the, I mean, all of that I designed and had printed the boarding passes. Uh, there are, you know, Taubus's clippings, the clippings file, all that stuff, all the text I didn't write, but modeled after existing reporting about Paul DeMond, who was a philosopher who had a kind of anti-Semitic past that was very controversial in the 80s. Um, and the, uh, the photograph, I should say, of the, the man who's meant to be Stephen Talbot is Jacques Rancière. And uh, he has a very good face. And it was in the public domain. And I thought, let's have Jacques Rancière play this, <laughs> this kook, you know. <laughs> Okay, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But as always, uh, there will be drinks and conversation just down the hall in the Bell Blue Room. So join us there. But yeah, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, Ricky.